Early in the 1940s, there appeared in San Francisco a mysterious man in a dark coat. This man was tall and majestic, with unforgettable eyes, mesmerizing eyes, the eyes of a fanatic, a saint, or an artist. The guy looked like Wyatt Earp and God at the same time. He looked like he came in from the Wild West on a horse, <laughs> and yet he looked like God. <laughs> There's a wonderful photograph of Still that I believe was made by his daughter. And you see this man, very elegant man, uh, with a gray beard, and he's wearing a painter's smock. And underneath the smock, he has a shirt and a tie on. That shirt and tie are, I think, indicative of an artist who saw himself with great seriousness. Nothing was an accident in his work, and nothing was an accident in terms of the way he presented himself to the world. Still was a classic American man of the West, this rugged individualist who was born in North Dakota and lived in Canada and taught in Eastern Washington and here in San Francisco. But I think for Still, the West and San Francisco in particular was a kind of relief from the East Coast. He took great pride in taking automobile trips and he loved the landscape of the West and the great expanse and the enormous scale. And I think one can see references to that in, a, in many, many of his paintings. Clifford Still spent the first 40 years of his life on the West Coast, and we can certainly claim him as a Westerner. And there's something about the way he worked and the openness and the vastness and almost boundlessness of those paintings that I think many of us sense probably has some relationship to his place and upbringing in the Western United States. In 1939, I was a freshman at Washington State. My first class in art was with Clifford Still in art history. I always felt as though he was dashing in and he usually came with paint on his shoes and he had quickly changed shirts or jackets and kind of threw it aside and was ready. He wanted to do it right, but I had the feeling that he wanted to get the class over and get back to a palette. He was very academic and very spiritual. I think he was very much into teaching because he wanted to, you know, project that to students. That painting was not just about picture making. He had a great impact on other younger artists through his teaching. He founded the graduate painting program at what is now the San Francisco Art Institute. And the city produced a number of great abstract painters. He really set a tone for abstract painting here. Painters such as Richard Diebenkorn and Frank Lobdell, Nathan Oliveira. What still did was very much in the air in San Francisco at that time. People are going to go on making art one way or the other, practically whether they want to or not. But anyway, the art making will continue. There's always a lot of talk, and has been for the last 30 years or more that I've been around, about painting and the problems of painting. It's as though those problems exist and will continue to exist, but in some magic way, they never existed for still because it's a kind of pure painting. 
and the effort and the paintings that were created uh, reached a, a really high level in a certain sense, almost effortlessly, and with a kind of originality that you can't duplicate. So I don't know how people are gonna paint like that uh, and have, uh, be able to get that kind of effect, but still was able to do it, and as I said, with remarkable ease.